and welcome back to another lecture of Statistics 568 Design and Analysis of Experiments. We just did the full 3K, 3 to the K factorial design. Now we're going to do the 3 to the K fractional factorial design because 3 to the K is a lot of sample to collect and we probably don't want to do that. So let's take a fractional design approach. Working with a 3 to the k design, as I mentioned, we typically don't want to collect 3 to the k data points because that's a lot, even if k is not that big. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a fractional design approach. We're going to, well, shrink the data size, but then similar to the full factor, the fractional factorial design for binary factors, we're going to run into a problem, and that problem is aliasing. But now the aliasing is going to be more complicated, let's say. Uh, not only are we going to have aliasing, we're going to have something called partial aliasing. It's a good time and we're going to work through an example of the sugarcane data that we looked at at the, at the end of uh, last lecture. We're going to put all of this together and hopefully get an idea of how to do a fractional factorial design with three level factors. So let's get into the notes. And welcome back to another lecture of Statistics 568, Design and Analysis of Experiments. Today we're going to continue our study of the 3 to the k factorial design, but we're going to be taking it in a more useful direction. That is, we're going to consider the 3 to the k fractional factorial design. I say more useful because, as we saw with the 2 to the k design, the sample size can grow quite quickly. And it's even worse in the 3 to the k design, right? 3 to the 4, that's 81 data points. 3 to the 6, that's, what, 729 data points? That's a lot of data points, um, and with only six factors. So typically, and also based on the fact that what we saw in the last lecture was a lot of times these higher order interaction terms are kind of unintelligible anyway, um, we're going to want to do some aliasing. That is, we're going to want to have a fractional design cut down our sample size and deal with the aliasing because we probably don't care about those weird high order interactions anyway. Um, but how do we do that in a sensible way? Well, we're going to find out in today's lecture. So let's jump into the notes. All right. So in today's lecture, we'll be talking about the um, three to the K minus Q fractional factorial design. And what we're going to find is that it's going to behave very similarly to the 2 to the k fractional factor, 2 to the k minus q fractional factorial design. Um, again, I wanted to point out what I said in the introduction, which is this is, well, basically this is a very useful, useful, because one, three to the K is a lot of data points. And two, high order interactions are hard to interpret. And they're probably not going to be significant anyway. It is still good to test some interactions, maybe pairwise interactions. I have a strange little drop of water on my shirt here, or on my glasses, that is. There we go. Now I can uh, see unobstructed. Um, but yeah, the idea is that these high order interactions are very hard to interpret. Um, we probably aren't going to be able to figure them out anyway, even if there was some significance there. Um, it's better to just have a fractional design and focus on the main effects, the two-way interactions, and maybe the three ways. Um, but now what we have to figure out is, well, what in the world happens when we try to construct a fractional design? Um, specifically, what happens with the aliasing? So let's do an example. Say that we want to do a 3 to the 4 minus 1 design, I'll say with 
factors, experimental factors A, B, C, and D. All right. So what we need is we need some interaction term to be aliased or yeah to equal the identity right to be aliased with the identity um, like we did um, for the two to the k design so in this case the example that i have is we can choose some interaction now if we consider the fact that a we want to maybe start with a four-way interaction because we have four factors four is the highest number of interactions but there's not just one four-way interaction all right, there's actually a whole multitude of them. Um, if we go back to our degrees of freedom, it'll be 16, right? It's 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. Um, so what we can do is we can pick a, a four-way interaction. The one that I chose in my notes is A, B squared, C squared, D equal to the identity. Right. Um, so that's just one possible choice. There's a lot of other four-way interactions we could consider. Uh, and we're going to find that, yeah, things can be a little bit um, complicated depending on, especially if we want to choose more than one uh, term to alias with the identity. That is, if we want to take Q and increase it from one to two to three or whatever, not in this case, um, <laughs> we'd want K to be bigger if we wanted to increase Q. But Anyway, um, yeah, what does this mean when I say a b squared c squared d is equal to i? Well, this is shorthand for modular arithmetic, which is telling us that a plus 2b plus 2c plus d is equal to 0 mod 3. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, uh, this interaction is really hard to interpret physically anyway. I mean, what in the world does it mean? Uh, I don't really know. Um, besides the fact that somehow, if it were significant, then somehow the four factors would be interacting in some specific way. Hence, what we do is we alias it with the identity. We can't estimate the significance of this term anymore, but we really don't care. Um, what we do care about is what's going to happen to all the other terms and the alias thing that will go on within our um, design. Okay, so now that we have an aliasing relation, um, we have to think about, well, what does that mean with respect to the other, um, the other effects, main effects and interaction effects in our model? So then the question might be, Okay, if we have that a b squared c squared d is aliased with the identity, then what is a aliased with? Well, in this case, there's two things we can consider. First, we can consider that if we multiply the above by a, we end up with a times a b squared c squared d which is going to be a squared, b squared, c squared, d. But as we noted before, we like to make sure that the very first exponent, this guy, is equal to 1 to handle that uniqueness ambiguity that we talked about in the last lecture. So what we do is we square the entire thing. And by squaring it, we get an a4, b4, c4, sorry, 4, d2 and we can reduce mod 3 to turn 4 into 1 a b c d squared so this would be the other term that we are aliased that a is a well one one of the other terms that a is aliased with now again this is all shorthand for the modular arithmetic equation that I have above here. Um, if I really wanted to use this equation, I could add a to both sides and I would have something that would look like 2a plus 2b plus 2c plus d is equal to a mod 3 um, and so on. Then when I square it on the left hand side, I'm actually multiplying by 2 on the right hand side. So this is um, kind of what is happening in some sense uh, here. The 
other thing is that we don't want to just consider multiplying by a, but we also want to consider multiplying by a squared because a and a squared are equivalent terms. It's kind of like they're each, I don't want to say they're each one degree of freedom because it's a little bit different than that. They're actually, they're both equivalent in the sense that a and a squared are just relabelings of the factor levels. Um, so we have to consider, well, what is a squared aliased with? Because these two things are statistically identical when it comes to estimation in the ANOVA table. So whatever a is aliased with, or whatever a squared is aliased with, a will also be aliased with that. In this case, we end up with a cubed, b squared, c squared, d. Now, remember, we're working mod 3 in this case. So 3 is equal to 0 everywhere, which means the first term vanishes. a cubed is the identity. And we end up with b squared, c squared, d. Um, and again, if we were to square the entire thing, um, to make sure that the first coefficient or exponent is equal to 1, we get something that looks like this. So what we find out is that factor A up here is in fact aliased with a four-way interaction term and a three-way interaction term. So, okay, that, that's good. It's kind of what we'd imagine could happen based on... Um, our intuition with the 2 to the k design, but the problem is that now we have to consider the fact that A is going to be aliased with two different interactions rather than just one, and that complicates things a little bit. And we know that in total, in total, the 3 to the 4 minus 1 design has how many data points has 3 to the 3 equal 27 data points, which implies that we have 26 degrees of freedom, which implies we have 13 rows in our ANOVA table as each row requires two degrees of freedom. Right, remember that every main and interaction effect now, after decomposing into the orthogonal components that we talked about in the last lecture, will have two degrees of freedom because they are comparing, well, they have three different possible levels to work with. Um, and 3 minus 1 gives us 2 degrees of freedom for every row. So it's good always to remember how to count all of these things, and you have to do that in your uh, current assignment um, so that you kind of know what to expect, right? There's going to be 13 different main and interaction effects or aliased groups of effects that we're going to be able to estimate in this design. Um, we're going to have all the main effects, A, B, C, D, then we're going to have some two ways that are also going to be aliased with other two ways and three ways. Um, again, every, every effect in the design will be aliased with two other effects in the design that we have to consider. Now, in general, we can actually write this out. Um, well, this is kind of a general rule going on here, right? Um, when it comes to the number of things that we can actually estimate. So I'll say in general, going from 3 to the k to 3 to the k minus 1, um, well, what happens? Well, what happens is that we start with our 3 to the k minus 1 degrees of freedom divided by 2. And this is the, I'm going to say, number of rows in the ANOVA table. Now what happens is that in the, um, in the case of a 3 to the k minus 1 design, what we're doing is we're effectively saying, okay, well, what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to take my three to my um, three to the k minus one over two rows, right? So I'm going to start with the number of rows in my ANOVA table. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract one. We lose one of them um, because one of them gets aliased with the identity. And then we have to divide by three because all of the terms that remain get grouped into aliased aliased collections, I could say, of three effects. So again, we start with three to the k minus one divided by two. That's the number of rows in our full design. We lose one row, which gets aliased with the identity. Then of all that remain, we have to split them or group them into groups of three. So we have something that looks like this. And if we simplify this, what we find is we actually get three the k minus or three to the k minus one minus one divided by two. So it's kind of what we'd expect, which is it's the sample size minus one divided by two. But intuitively, this is what's going on, right? We one row lost to the maybe to being aliased with i and then we're going to say aliased groups of three terms or we'll say rows from the original ANOVA table. So this is kind of what's going on when we do a fractional design. Unlike the two to the k case where we cut our data in half, in this case, we're actually reducing it to a third of its original size. So it's another reason why the fractional design is even more valued in this case, because you're getting a much more significant decrease in your um, data requirements, um, which is going to save you a lot of time and money running your experiment. All right. So that's all well and good if we just have one aliasing relation, if we have a 3 to the k minus 1. But what happens if we have a 3 to the k minus 2? Well, now things can get really complicated, and it's one of the reasons why you have to be really, really careful when you construct a 3 to the k minus q general factorial design. Because if you remember from the 2 to the k case, when you have um, two different aliasing relations, you start to get another one in there and you start to get, um, you can sometimes get yourself into trouble where you pick two reasonable terms to alias with the identity, but then you end up getting other terms aliased with the identity that are really bad and you might even lose a main effect. You might end up with a resolution to design. These are all bad things we don't want to have happen. So let's do another example. In this case, our example is going to be a three to the, I think we're still doing three to the four. Yeah, we're doing a three to the four minus two. So now we're reducing our data size from 81 down to nine, which yeah, that's kind of extreme, but uh, it's still worth um, looking at for as a, uh, um, as a hypothetical example um, for the sake of instruction. So let's say we have our original aliasing relation, which is a b squared c squared d. And we're going to alias that with, let's just pick another four-way interaction term. Uh, how about a, b, c, and d, which seems like a reasonable choice maybe, but is it? Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to see what happens when we do this. Well, if we have these two terms being aliased with the identity, then we also have a couple other terms. We're also going to have i is equal to the product of these two things times a, b, c, d. And when we multiply these two things together, we're going to end up with an a squared, a b cubed, a c cubed, and a d squared.
And then when we reduce this, well, first of all, we can get rid of the B and the C because they have an exponent of three, which means they become the identity. Remember, every element in this group has order three, which means if I cube it, I get the identity out. Um, I'm left with a squared d squared, which if you recall from above, we can square it and reduce mod three to show that a squared d squared is equivalent to a d. Ah, so that is troublesome. Because that means we now have a resolution two design a and d the main effects have been aliased together. Um, well, the yeah, A and D have been aliased together um, because AD is aliased with the identity, and that's bad, right? That means that we now have a resolution to design, and we have kind of failed and chosen a very poor design. Um, but we're not even done yet because there's another aliasing relation hiding in there because we also have to consider... Um, squaring one of these, we have to consider the interaction between a, b squared, c squared, d, and a squared, b squared, c squared, d squared. Because what we have to do is similar to above where I squared a, I looked at a and a squared, we have to consider the interaction between a term, two terms, and then one of those terms squared. If we square both terms, we're just going to get something equivalent. You can kind of work that out if you want to try it. But in this case, what happens is you end up with an a cubed, a b to the fourth, a c to the fourth, and a d cubed. If we get rid of these terms and reduce mod 3, then we're left with a b c. And now we actually have a second term that is alias um, a second order two or two-way interaction, which is aliased with the identity, which means that now we can no longer differentiate between A and D, and we can no longer differentiate between B and C. So the point, the take home is be careful when constructing A three to the K minus Q design because you can very easily get yourself into trouble just by picking big interaction terms to alias with the identity, which is a reasonable thing to do. Um, you have to be very careful when you do that. Um, but regardless, um, going forward, we can still consider some counting that I think is useful to do, uh, similar to what we did up here. To try to get a sense of what is happening when we do this aliasing because it can be a little confusing at first and we will look at that data set later which hope should hopefully give you some more practical um, grounding to understand a fractional three to the k minus q design but let's go back and actually do some numbers because i think the numbers are going to make this a little bit easier to understand so for a three to the four design, we have 40 rows in the ANOVA table. That's 81 minus one for the global mean divided by two which is yeah, just three to the four minus one divided by two. That's gonna get you your 40 rows. These are all the different, I should say, these rows are all the main and interaction effects. And again, I'm assuming that we're taking all of the interaction terms and we're breaking them into their orthogonal components. Um, so every two-way term gets broken into two different orthogonal components. Every three-way gets broken into four. Every four-way gets broken into, I guess, 16, if I'm doing that right. Um, yeah, of course, just two times two times two times two. Um, 
so that's what I mean by rows in the ANOVA table. Um, now, what happens if we go to a for a 3 to the 4 minus 1 design? Well, what do we have? We already did this above, but I'm going to do it again. We have now, well, what? We have 3 to the 4 minus 1, which is 27, minus 1 divided by 2 equal to 13 rows of with, I guess, of, uh, trying to figure out how to say this in English, <laughs> of alias of 3 alias fx each. That is my 40 rows were now condensed down to 13 rows. Every row corresponds to three terms that are alias together. Um, and again, one is lost to the um, uh, to being aliased with the identity. Now, when we go one step further here, for a three to the four minus two design, we have well. Now we just have nine minus one divided by two, which is four rows. And we have four rows, but how many things are being aliased together? Well, in this case, it's going to be nine. We're going to have nine aliased effects each. So you can you can kind of see this from above that if I have um, it's a little bit confusing, but um, effectively what I have is if I have four. I have four things here in my defining contrast subgroup, right? My red boxes correspond to four different interaction effects that lie within the um, defining contrast subgroup. Now, if I want to figure out what factor A is aliased with, I have to take A and multiply it by each of these four things. And then I have to take A squared and multiply it by each of those four things. And what I end up with is I end up with A, the four things that A is aliased with, and the four things that A squared is aliased with, which becomes 4 plus 4 plus 1 is 9. And that's my 9 aliased effects each. So yes, I do want to point out for anyone who's worried about practical sensibilities that you probably wouldn't want to run a 3 to the 4 minus 2 design because you're only going to get four rows, which means if you're lucky, you might figure out a way to have all the main effects not aliased with two-way interactions or higher. I'm not even sure if that's possible. We'd have to actually sit down and work it out to see if you could do that. Um, but I guess if you really wanted to, you could try it, um, though you probably wouldn't have a lot of statistical power in this design. Um, but it's still the the intuition is still very important for when you go to when you when k is bigger, right? If k is six or something, and you definitely don't want to do a three to the six design, three to the six minus two is more reasonable. What terms do I choose? to um, put in my defining contrast subgroup, and what are the consequences of getting those terms in there? These are things that you really have to be careful with when you're working with a fractional 3 to the k minus q design. All right, so we just talked about how it's really important to be careful what you choose to be in your defining contrast subgroup when you're constructing a 3 to the k minus q fractional factorial design. But we're not done there because in the last lecture, we talked about how you can look at um, ordinal factors in a um, three to the k design. That is, if you have an ordering of your three factor levels, like small, medium, and large, you can consider polynomial contrasts, and you can consider both linear and quadratic contrasts and interaction contrast, polynomial contrast, which yeah, are a little bit hard to understand at first. We drew a lot of box plots last lecture. If you have questions about that, please come and email me, talk to me, um, come on to Zoom, and we can figure that out. Um, but, and don't hate me for saying this, but 
it's going to get even worse because now we have to consider that when we do aliasing, we're going to get something called partial aliasing. So, so far, when we've looked at aliasing for the two to the K design, we only had two possible cases. The case is that if I take two effects, whether it's an interaction or a main or other, well, those are the only two options. So if I choose either interactions or main or whatever effects, if I have two different effects, there's only, well, two things that can occur. Either they're orthogonal to each other, which means that estimating that effect and testing, hypothesis testing without those two effects are independent of each other, or they're perfectly correlated and they coincide this is the aliasing issue. So if two effects are aliased together, perfectly aliased together, they're going to coincide and we can't um, differentiate one from the other. On the other hand, if they're not aliased, they were orthogonal and they just are completely, well, orthogonal. They're um, not going to be correlated and hypothesis testing will be independent, again, assuming Gaussian, which we're assuming all the errors are normal in this course. Now, the weird thing is that in this case, with a 3 to the k design with polynomial contrasts, you can get partial aliasing, which means that two of the effects in your model will not be perfectly correlated, but they won't be perfectly orthogonal either. They're going to be at like a angle that's neither right nor zero to each other, and this is going to be partial aliasing, and it's something that we have to well, take a closer look at. So let's see what this is all about. The next section, again, is partial aliasing. So what we're going to do is we're going to consider a simple example, again, one that I can actually write out. I know some people at home were saying, well, when would you ever use an example with like nine data points? I'm like, well, typically you probably wouldn't do a three to the three minus one design, but it's something small enough that I can write down in my notebook um, for instructional purposes. So that's what we're going to work with. Um, we're going to say a three to the three minus one with defining relation I is equal to A, B, C. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, that means, therefore, we have four things. That's really imprecise. Four rows or four effects, four alias groups of effects to um, estimate. And what that's going to look like is we're going to have A, and you can check these just to make sure you kind of understand how aliasing works in a three to the K setting. Um, I'm just gonna write this down fast to point out that A is aliased with BC, is aliased with A, B squared, C squared. Though I do encourage you to try deriving these on your own just to see if you can understand how the groups, the group theory works in this setting. Um, it's a good exercise. Anyway, we have A, B squared, C. Uh, we have C is aliased with A, B, and it's also aliased with A, B, C squared. And then we have one more term in our ANOVA table, and it's going to be the other two-way interactions. We're going to have an A, B squared aliased with an A, C squared aliased with a B, C squared. So these are the four things that we're going to look, um, the four things that we would be working with in our ANOVA table. Um, furthermore, well, what we get is, I guess I can write out the actual table um, just to show you what it looks like. So the actual table of, um, or the design matrix, I should say, will look something like A, B, C. And what we're going to get is 0, 0, 0. 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, 1, 1, 2, 0, uh, what, 1, 0, 2, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 0, 2, 0, 1, and 2, 2, 2. 
So what you should be able to check is that if I take any two of those three columns, I should see every combination of symbols 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 2, 1, 1, 2, and 2, 2. Um, and that's the um, sort of balanced orthogonal condition that we talked about before. We also would have our interaction. Um, we have one more row, which is the interaction A to or B squared, which is equivalent, right, to saying mathematically A plus 2B mod 3. So I can construct the final row by just taking, or the final column, sorry, by taking A plus 2 times B. And what I get is something that's going to look like 0, 2, 1, uh, 2, 1, 0, and 1, 2, 0. So this is what my table is going to look like. Again, each of these is going to have um, two degrees of freedom each. So now is when things become a little bit funny because what we can do is we can break each of these. So the idea is that each of these can be decomposed into polynomial contrasts, assuming we have ordinal or dinal factors. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to use polynomial contrast. But if these are ordinal, like in the example that we're going to do in the final part of today's lecture, um, you can break them into, you can take these four things and you actually end up breaking them into, um, well, not exactly four, you break them into, um, well, you break each of them into two, except for the interaction term, which becomes four. Um, I'll, I'll just write it all out. Actually, no, I'm not going to write it all out. I'm going to copy it over from my notes, which means we might destroy my OneNote if I'm not careful. So assuming that uh, we'll take a, a quick break. All right, and we're back. And I think we are still recording on all fronts. Excellent. Um, and we have our nice little table here, so I don't have to try to recreate it by hand. So what we get is we get an entire table of contrasts. And it's going to look something like this. Basically, what we're doing is I'm expanding the A columns, A, B, C, and A, B squared into their polynomial contrasts. Um, so what that means is basically, for example, A, L maps 0, 1, and 2 into the points minus 1, 0, and 1. Now, I'm not dividing in this table by the corresponding. There's a normalizing factor. Whenever you do polynomial contrasts in R, it's going to take this and it's going to divide by root 2 so that if you square it and sum it, you get 1. Similarly, for the quadratic ones, it's going to divide by root 6, as we saw in the lecture last time. That's just to normalize things. So it's not something that uh, I'm going to worry about for this table. I just care about the, the numbers themselves. And then the normalization is kind of something that happens behind the scenes. But basically, um, the quadratic term is going to map 0, 1, and 2 into plus 1, minus 2, and plus 1. So that's what's happening in this um, table that I pasted into the document. It's taking the table that I have up here and it's going down the first column and saying, okay, 0, 0, 0 is minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. 1, 1, 1 is 0, 0, 0, and 2, 2, 2 is 1, 1, 1. The difference is that up here we treat these as factor levels. And down here we treat these as, um, well, numbers. <laughs> I guess I should say numeric values to try to coincide with R, where you can say as dot numeric to tell R to treat 
a number as a, well, number rather than treating a number as a factor. Um, but yeah, similarly, AQ is going to map 0, 1, 2 to 1, minus 2, 1. So if you look down the second column here, it turns the 0, 0, 0 and the 2, 2, 2 into 1s. And then the middle, the 1s get mapped to minus 2s here. Uh, the same thing happens for B and C. And then last, and actually the same thing happens, I guess, also for the interaction term. Um, well, almost. The interaction term, sorry, is a little bit more complicated as to what's actually going on here. Um, because you might notice that there's, well, a bunch of zeros in here. There seem to be more zeros, for example, in the interaction term than um, before. And this is going to cause some interesting uh troubles right um because what we're doing is we're basically kind of multiplying the two columns together so if you want to look at if you want to look at a b l l this one is going to be the product of this column and this column element wise so that's why you get this big block of zeros here is because you have a big block of zeros here um, in the A column, and then you would take the minus one, zero, one, and you'd flip the signs to get one, zero, minus one, um, and so on. So that's where you're getting these four columns. All right, so theoretically, I could put in my data, tell it to do the contrast and get rows in my ANOVA table corresponding to the linear and quadratic contrast, as well as these interactions. But wait, we should probably count these things. How many columns do I have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Huh. So I have 10 columns with 1 degree of freedom each. But up here, I have four columns with two degrees of freedom each, which is a total of eight degrees of freedom. So, and remember what I said, we only have nine data points and nine minus one is eight. So we only have eight degrees of freedom to work with, which means something's not right with this table because we can't estimate all of these terms uniquely. We can't estimate 10 different polynomial contrasts if we only have eight degrees of freedom to work with. So what's happening? Well, what's happening is this partial aliasing I'm, I was talking about. Um, what we find out is that if we look at some of these columns, they're not perfectly um, orthogonal to each other. So first of all, if we take if we take this entire block, we find out that the first six columns are pairwise orthogonal. And in this case, I mean orthogonal in the typical linear algebra sense. If I take any of these two columns and do a dot product, one with the other, I'm going to get zero. So in some sense, they all are at right angles to each other in nine-dimensional space, I guess, because we have nine elements. So they're all vectors, and all of these vectors are at right angles to one another. Um, yeah, but what happens in the other case? So let's... Uh, Let's do an example. If we take C linear, well, C linear is going to be written horizontally, minus one, plus one, zero. Minus one, plus one, zero. Um, minus one, zero, one. Is that right? That probably is right, but let me just double check. Minus one plus one, zero. Yeah, it is. It's zero, two, one, zero, two, one, zero, one, two. Okay. It just felt kind of strange to me the way it looked, but uh, I guess it's correct. <laughs>
And then we have a, let's do L, or sorry, a B. L and Q. Well, if we look at that row, what are we going to get? We're going to get a minus one, a two, a minus one, then zero, 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 uh, and then a minus two and a plus one, plus one. So if I do a dot product between these two things, um, what do I get? Well, I get a plus one, I get a plus two, I get a zero, 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 a plus three, there's not a plus three. I multiply those together and I get a plus two, a zero, and a plus one. And when I add these together, I end up with six, which is not zero. So those two columns are not orthogonal to each other. They're not identical either though, because um, if we actually were to have normalized this correctly, I would actually be dividing the linear bit by root 2, and I'd be dividing this one by, well, root 2 times root 6, which is root 12, which is 2 root 3. So you end up with something like this. So what I'm actually doing is I'm dividing this whole thing by 2 root 6, I guess. Um, which if we kind of, is that correct? I think that's correct. Let me double check that. I know what I want to get out is the right answer. I think it should be two root six. Maybe I got the um, thing in my table wrong because in this case, what I would end up with is a root six divided by two, which if we, um, I guess would be like a square root of, three over two, um, right? Yeah, which is not exactly what I wrote in my other table in my notes. So I'm gonna have to double check that to, um, later to see what's uh, where the error is in the um, arithmetic. I'm not gonna do that live. Just double checking really fast in my head. No, it still looks like it's six, so. Well, regardless, I'll look at that a little bit later because I don't want to, um, it's kind of um, beyond the point of what I'm trying to get at. What I'm trying to get at is that if we, um, if we were to look at the dot product between, oh, that's the wrong table. If we were to look at the dot product between all of these columns, with, like pairwise between um, pairs of columns, then what we end up with, according to the last time I did these calculations, um, I got something like this after normalizing by the proper normalizing coefficient, which I might be messing up here. Um, I need to double check. But the idea is that, okay, if we look at C linear and C quadratic, we see that, well, they are not correlated with each other. That is, they're orthogonal to each other. These columns are orthogonal to each other. But what we find out is that C linear is not orthogonal with either A linear AB linear quadratic or AB quadratic linear, which means that there is this partial aliasing going on here. It's saying that the correlation is not one. If the correlation is one, then you're perfectly aliased. The correlation is zero, you're orthogonal. If the correlation lies in between zero and one, which is also why I think that this has to be wrong because the square root of three over two is greater than one, and I don't wanna have a correlation greater than one. So I'm gonna assume that I made a slight mistake here somewhere, and that the correct answer is one over root two, which is the makes a lot more sense mathematically in my head. Um, Anyway, the point is, is that you will have the case where some of your polynomial contrasts will be partially aliased with some of your other polynomial contrasts. So what does that mean practically? Well, practically what that means is that when you're doing your estimation, your p-values are no longer independent of each other. They have some correlation. Your estimates are going to have some 
dependency on each other. So significance in one of these terms may kind of bleed into the other one and vice versa. Uh, it's not a perfect correlation, but there's still a, co um, a partial correlation there or a partial aliasing nevertheless. So how do we deal with this, right? Um, well, so basically the takeaway to end this part of the lecture with is to say that when um, dealing with partial aliasing, tools like variable selection Um, in linear regression are useful because if you sat in the course that I used to teach on linear regression I would have told you about the idea of multicollinearity that is when you're dealing with regression forget about design of experiments if I just have regression and I'm trying to predict an out and a response variable with two different predictors and those two different predictors are highly correlated then typically I don't want to include both of them in my model I want to include one or the other but not both and variable selection methods will allow us to choose which one we should include in our model this is based on well Topics like AIC and BIC, these are model selection criteria that will tell us what model is preferable. Um, and what we're going to find when we look at that real data example that we can use things like variable selection to try to um, get a better sense of where the significance is coming from in our data. Because the problem with partial aliasing is that it might be well, it might be mixed. We might find significant in, in, in terms that aren't strictly significant, or we might even miss it because all the effects are kind of washed out and interacting with each other when we don't want that to happen. So that's basically everything I wanted to talk about with respect to fractional factorial designs for 3 to the k, that is 3 to the k minus q designs. What we're going to do now is we're going to jump into our studio and we're going to spend some time looking at that sugarcane data that we looked at in the last lecture, but we're going to look at it in its full glory and we're going to try to carefully understand what's going on because I think having a real physical example will be much uh, a much better tool for trying to understand that than me just doing a whole bunch of examples of crazy partial aliasing um, results. So. Yeah, we're going to jump into our studio now and I'll uh, see you there. And we're back and now we are in our studio and we're going to look at that sugarcane data again. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is load in the Agridat package with the library command. Um, and then we have to, well, look at this. Why isn't it? Oh, oh that's right. There we go. I was going to say, why aren't we auto-completing? the uh, Chinloy fractional factorial data set. So again, what is this data set that we're going to be looking at? Well, it is a 3 to the 5 minus 1 design. Um, they write it as 1 third 3 to the 5, but it's basically there's going to be 81 observations and five different experimental factors. Now within this experiment, there are a couple extra things. There is a row and a column position because this was one big, I guess, field of sugarcane. The response is a yield. There is a blocking factor. Um, I forget what it is, actually. So we'll see if it's actually in the documentation or not. But mainly the things we're interested in are going to be our five um, experimental factors. They're all ordinal variables. They take on three levels, 0, 1, and 2. Um, each of these levels corresponds to either none of the additive, some of the additive, or more of the additive to the soil, whether that's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, bagasse, I guess, I don't know what that is, uh, or filter press mud um, for our five factors. And you can see this one actually, unlike um, some R data sets, actually tells you a little bit about what was happening here. You can see each plot was um, 
what the size of it is. Yeah, arranged in nine columns of nine. So we have a nice big square um, plot here with row and columns. And yeah, that's, and they actually have a reference here if you really want to look it up in the Journal of Agricultural Science from the 1950s. Um, but what we want to do first is when we look at the data set, um, well, we have something that looks like this. And what we have to do is we have to tell R a couple things. We have to tell it that these rows and columns are um, fac factors, not numbers. And we also need to tell it that our um, experimental factors should be treated as factor objects, that is ordinal factor objects and not uh, numbers. Now, the way we do that is um, through a command that looks like transform. They've already done that for us, but I think what I want to do is I want to modify this command slightly and change it to as ordered. Now, I'm not sure if it's gonna make a huge difference, but I do wanna make sure that R knows that these are supposed to be ordinal um, for when we do our polynomial contrasts. Though based on the code presented with this package, I'm guessing that it may uh, not matter in the end anyway. But regardless, we've done that. Oh, and it got mad at me because I forgot to load in this data here. Um, so we're just going to call the entire data set dat so that I don't have to keep writing chinloy dot fractional factorial, which is kind of annoying. All right, now we have our data set loaded in. So what are we going to do? Well, let's ignore all of the, um, the blocking and the row factors and the column factors. And first, let's just fit a, uh, uh, the factorial uh, model to the data, the fractional factorial model. So what that's going to look like is we're going to use the AOV function and we're going to type in yield and yield is going to be, well, it's going to be our experimental factors, which in this case is going to be N plus P plus K plus B plus F. And we're going to take that to the fifth power which is going to tell R that we want every possible combination from main effects all the way to fifth order interactions. Now, we're not going to get all of those because it's a fractional design. So we fit the data. It gets mad at me. Why did it get mad at me? Oh, because I put an equal sign instead of a tilde. Ah, silly mistake. All right, so now that we fit this model, let's look at the ANOVA table and see what it tells us. Well, the ANOVA table here, now again, if we count the number of rows, okay, it's not gonna be, um, what should it be? Well, it should be uh, 81 minus one is 80 divided by two degrees of freedom is 40, but the way it stands here, we actually have interaction terms with four and eight degrees of freedom. But you might notice there's some weird little things going on here in our ANOVA table. So the first thing is we have our main effects. Okay, that's great. That's, that's good. Then we have our two-way interactions. We say, wait a minute. Some of these two-way interactions have four degrees of freedom. Some of them only have two degrees of freedom. And the problem is that some of these terms, KB, one of the KB interactions, remember KB can be broken into two different interactions, K times B or K times B squared. One of those is in the defining contrast subgroup. One of those is not, which means we've lost two degrees of freedom. Uh, similarly, when we get down to our three ways terms, we actually should have eight. That is, we have four different orthogonal interactions with two degrees of freedom each. But in certain of these, we've actually lost two of them, and we only retain two of the four um, interaction terms, which would correspond to four of the eight degrees of freedom. So I hope you're uh, kind of sticking with me as I, I, as I say all this. Um, also, yeah, we don't have... Um, right any replication in this so we don't have any uh, residuals left for our for our um we don't have any residuals left um to have or 
we have no degrees of freedom left for our residuals, so we have no F statistics here to look at. Now, um, yeah, I think in this case, what they do is they fit a um, a submodel or something to the data. But we're going to take a slightly different approach. Um, so yeah, I might jump, actually, yeah, I should probably jump back into the notes and actually describe what's going on here, but it's kind of hard to switch between OneNote and our studio. So right now, we're just going to push forward and look at different ways to analyze this data. Um, yes, so I guess what they were saying here, and if you look it up, is the fact that in the original study, the authors were only interested in main and two-way interactions. And that's a reasonable thing because, as I mentioned before, when you get to some of these higher order interactions, even if we saw some significance here, we might not know what in the world that significance means. Um, so instead, the model, I think the one that they propose here is a slight sub-model. Here they're just looking at N interacting with P, K, B, and F. Instead of that, though, what I want to do is I want to go back to our original model and I'm going to replace the 5 with a 2. So this is what this means now is that I am removing all of the third and higher order interactions. So all of these degrees of freedom here, that is 888 eight, eight, and 444, four, four, which is 12 times 3, which is 36, all of that gets shoved into the residuals here. So we get 36 degrees of freedom, which correspond to the sums of squares with the third and higher order interaction terms. Um, and that becomes our residual degrees of freedom. So it's kind of saying that we're assuming that none of those third or higher order interaction terms are kind of significant in any way. All of that's going to be random noise in our data set. All of that random noise can be treated, at, be shoved into a residuals term. And then we now have 36 degrees of freedom left over to compute a residual sum of squares and a residual mean squared, which is our estimate of the variance, which is great because that means we can start to get some significance tests and we start to see things that are actually significant here. N is at 2.7%, P is very significant, um, F very significant, B is somewhat, you know, it's getting close to that 1% threshold. Um, okay, we have some other terms like N times P, which is not significant, but the P value is getting a little small, and P crossed with F, which has just crossed over the 5% threshold for... Um, significance if we're going to just stick with that. Now, um, what I want to do though is go a little bit further here because like I said in the last lecture, sometimes if you see an interaction term like P crossed with F, it has four degrees of freedom um, and it has a P value that's slightly under 5%, which might look significant. If we try to do multiple testing correction, it's not going to look significant anymore. So that one's kind of on the borderline. The question is, is that actually interesting or not? Um, so if we um, if we were to go back and go to our summary and say, you know what? I want to look at that P crossed with F term a little bit closer. I'm going to split it based on polynomial contrast. And in this case, we tell it L is 1, Q is 2. Two, um, no, that's not the right way to do it. It's a list of lists. P is equal to a list where the elements of that list are going to be L is equal to one and Q is equal to two. And similarly, I'm gonna do the same thing for factor F, yes, F, which is gonna be a list L is equal to one, Q is equal to two. So now when I do that, the reason I'm doing it this way is so I don't split all of them, because if I split all of them, then every term is going to start splitting up with N and, you know, K and B and all the other ones. Here I'm just splitting P and uh, F. And the first thing we note is that, well, 
um, P was significant, had a pretty small P value, even uh, with two degrees of freedom. When we split it up by its contrast, we see that that significance is in fact coming from the linear contrast and not from the quadratic contrast. So this tells us that again, if we were to plot our data, which we could do that just for fun to see if uh, we get the answer that we want. If we were to plot our data um, as a box plot using uh, this command, we should see a linear increase or decrease, presumably an increase, that is as we add more, I think P was phosphorus, right? Yeah, as we add more, yeah, because K is potassium. So if we add more phosphorus to the to the sugar cane, then yeah, it looks like it's going up a little bit. Okay, it's not a perfect line, um, but we do see a notable increase from zero to one. And then between one and two, we don't see a big change in the yield, but at least adding phosphorus does seem to add an increase. So there's our, that's where we get that, I guess that linear increase in P. Um, but more interestingly, I mean, we see the same thing, I guess, in F, right? F is significant, but we realize that significance is coming from the linear contrast and not really from the quadratic contrast. Um, but more interestingly is when we jump down here to the P crossed with F term, because again, a P value close to 5%, it's somewhat significant. It's getting small, but it's really one of those where you think, okay, after multiple testing correction, is this going to be significant or is it just um, like a false positive? Um, but when we split it up by contrast, suddenly we see, wow, now we're down to 0.3%. And we find out that the linear crossed with linear contrast is very significant. So that means that somehow the factor P and factor F are interacting linearly with each other. Now I have some plots in my um, notes that kind of show that. Maybe I can switch back over to OneNote and we can try to look at this data a little bit more in detail because there's actually a lot going on here that I can't do in RStudio. It's better to write it out on paper. Um, that being said though, let's... Um, yeah, no, I think it's going to be hard to, uh, hard to code this um, the way that I want to. Yeah, no, I think there is something called like an expand, nah, nah, forget it. I was gonna try and see, well, we can try it. I think this is gonna give me an error, but we're gonna try it anyway and see what happens. I think this is not what I want because this is probably gonna give me a big grid. Ah, I got my, boxes the way I want it, but it's not doing exactly what I want. I was hoping to plot box plots for factor P crossed with F. Um, luckily, I already did that um, in my online course notes, so perhaps we'll just jump back and look at those. But before we leave our studio, I do want to look at variable selection because this is another part that's really interesting. So if we go back to our um, Oh yeah, I guess there's a couple different things we want to do. But if we go back to our model too, um, let's use the step command. And the step command will do backwards variable selection. So what it's going to do is it's going to start throwing out terms from our model. Um, and it's going to come down and tell us that, you know what we only really need? We only really need N, P, K, B, and N crossed with P. So actually in this, oh no, we did... Uh, Oh good, no, we still have our P crossed with F as well. I was worried there for a second. Actually, I should um, save this so we can look at the ANOVA table. We'll call it MD2.step. And now if I do my summary of MD2.step, we get our ANOVA table out. And what it did was it threw out all the other two-way interaction terms except for NP and PF. And now we have... Um, well, slightly, I guess, stronger um, signals for the NP and PF interactions. Yeah, the F values, like two and a half and three, whereas if we scroll up through all this mess, yeah, the step function just shoves out a ton of output when you run it. It's kind of annoying, but um, otherwise it's kind of neat to do variable selection. Yeah, if we go back to our NP, NP here wasn't even 
no, uh, noticeably significant uh, when we first looked at it. It said, okay, I had a P value of around like 8%, which is, I guess, a little small, but it's not that small. It's what, like one in 12 chance. That doesn't seem too, uh, too surprising of a P value. But once we do variable selection, we get rid of all that noise and suddenly we say, ah, look at that. Now we're at 5% or slightly under. We're at 4.4% of P value. If we go back and use that um, split command on the new stepwise model. And you know what? Um, while we're at it, why don't we split on everything, or at least N. Um, I can just copy this over because it's the same command. If we split on N as well, I don't really care too much about the other two. Um, then we can look at the interaction here. And in this case, it's a little bit of a different outcome. Here, it looks like a lot of the significance is, well, it's actually kind of split. We see some in the quadratic quadratic, but we also see some in the linear linear and even a less significant amount of interaction variance, you could say, in the linear quadratic contrast here. So I guess n crossed with p is a little bit like not as straightforward what's going on. Whereas p crossed with f, we see that it's really all come, the signal is all coming from the linear cross, linear, linear contrast. Um, and otherwise, yeah, we see sort of other things happening here when we split up by our polynomial contrasts. Um, yeah, so before... Yeah, before we jump back into the notes, well, we're actually kind of probably running out of time and I don't want this lecture to go on for two hours. So what we're going to do is we'll look at the, um, maybe we'll save a written version of this, uh, this analysis for the next lecture. What I'm going to do now, though, is I want to fit another model to the data. I want to bring in the block as a random effect. So... We'll call this model three. And in this case, we can treat, we can use the air function here and put the block variable in. I don't remember what the block variable is. It doesn't seem like it was mentioned in the documentation, sadly enough. Um, so we'll probably have to dig out their paper and see what exactly they were doing with their block factor. Um, but for the sake of, again, it's always good to know how data was collected because that can mean how I should treat the block factor. But right now, we'll just treat it as a random effect. And what happens is if we... Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it actually took out PK. So that means that uh, the block factor is actually... Oh, that's actually quite neat. So I didn't even have to nest it. It means that um, in this case... I guess the block factor already kind of coincides with um, P crossed with K, uh, which means that P crossed with K gets sucked out of the regular ANOVA table and is tested um, at the block level here with respect to its residuals, um, whereas all the other terms are, I guess, fully randomized within the block. Um, and they get their residuals here. So this is kind of funny because what happened was our residuals went from 36 down to 30 because six of them have gone to the residuals for the block term and two of them moved from PK down here to PK up there. So that's kind of a, a neat little find in the table. Um, I guess that goes back to the idea of confounding, um, but, the, I, but here the block factor, I think... Is, is it eight levels? Let's look at that. We can actually say levels. Yeah, so that's, or nine levels, sorry, I forgot. Eight degrees of freedom, nine levels. So this is actually another interesting thing is that here we have a block factor that has nine levels in it, but our experimental factors and our interactions are just uh, three levels or I guess, um, the interactions have more if you consider all the crosses, but um, yeah, this means that the confounding can be quite, 
um, strange and a little bit complicated. In this case, we have um, PK sort of confounded within the block factor, which is why it popped up here. But regardless of all that, um, yeah, we definitely see a change in the P values, both NP, N crossed with P, and P crossed with F drop. We get much more, a much stronger F statistic in both cases, um, which is good. It means that by using whatever this block factor is uh, that appeared in the study, it uh, did a good job at reducing the variance um, or the variation in the data, um, our mean residual error or our our mean squared residual errors here uh, has dropped from about 0.5 to 0.3, so that's always good. If that drops down, that means the denominator of the F statistic goes down. That means your F statistics value goes up. That means you're more likely to get a significant p-value out at the end. And oh yes, I had one other point that I wanted to make about this data. Um, and that's the idea of, again, type, where's my, there's my R. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, we have one more thing to point out, which is the idea of, of well, type two and type three ANOVA. Um, because what I say is that, okay, we had our nice data. Let's forget about the block factor. I just want to look at the data without it for right now for instructional purposes. If we reordered the way I wrote this in NPKBF, Okay, what if I wrote NBPKF? So NBPKF, something like that. All right, well, let's look at the summary of this one. Okay, so what happened there? Some things seem to be a little bit different. Let's go back to the summary of the corresponding model two. So model two here, we saw a bit of significance, again, sort of like the threshold for significance for P crossed with F at four degrees of freedom. What happened up here? Well, now P crossed with F only has two degrees of freedom. Huh, so that's troublesome. What happened? Well, what happened is that one of the one of the um, interaction, the orthogonal components of P crossed with F is aliased with another two-way interaction. Now, I don't remember exactly which one that is. We're going to go look at it um, in the next lecture. I'll write this all out on paper so you can see it in detail, and hopefully this will help you understand more what's going on. But, um, but here, the idea is that one of these terms up here has stolen the two degrees of freedom from PF, and now we would overlook it and not even notice that it is significant at all here, whereas down here, um, it gets its four degrees of freedom, and it does look like there might be some significance hiding in that interaction term. So notice like um, KB is now, well, KB is now non-existent, I think, but BF here BF has two degrees of freedom, here BF has four degrees of freedom. So again, this is why reordering your data can be really dangerous um, because you might see something with one ordering in your ANOVA model and you might not see it if you reorder your data. But there is a fix for that. The fix is, well, just do stepwise variable selection because as we saw before, if we were to say, do a stepwise selection, the stepwise, the backwards selection does not care about how we ordered our data. The ANOVA table does, and that's why it's a little bit dangerous and we have to be careful with it. But when we do stepwise variable selection, we should get the exact same thing out again, yes. And we get the same model as we did last time, which is all the main effects, N interacting with P, and P interacting with F and nothing else. So stepwise selection is clever enough and it knows which one to pick. But you still have to be really careful before you do stepwise selection when you're just looking at um, the, um, the table itself. And I guess there's one more thing to note and that's what would happen if we went back to our model four and we tried to split on um, P. 
and um, L is equal to one, Q is equal to two, and um, what was the other one? F, let's say list L is equal to one, Q is equal to two. If we do it this time, what happens to our P and F? Well, our P and F says, okay, there's four different quadratic, um, or there's four different polynomial contrasts, but I'm only going to give you p-values and sums of squares for two of them because the other two vanished um, because of the lack of degrees of freedom. So again, these are all these weird little quirks that can pop up when you're trying to analyze data like this that you have to be aware of. It's one of the reasons why, again, just in summary, as we look to end the lecture, um, stepwise variable selection is very important to know about when you're dealing with one of these big factorial experiments because you ultimately want to try to get rid of all this um, extra junk here. Now, I believe if you tried doing stepwise variable selection on the full model, I think it fails because you don't have any degrees of freedom left for the residuals, but let's see, yeah. And that gives you an AIC of minus infinity, which is bad, we don't want that. So that's why you have to start with, say, a model that only includes the main effects and the two-way interaction terms. And yes, so that's the overview of the sugarcane data. In the next lecture, what we'll do is we're going to go back to this and we're going to write it out in excruciating detail just to make sure it's clear. And then we should probably have time to jump into response surfaces. But now that I think about it, they're all recorded lectures anyway, so I can just cut them into as many pieces as I want. Uh, so yeah, I'll see you in the next lecture. We'll do a little bit more discussion on three to the K designs, and then we'll move into a new topic, response surfaces, which is also really cool. So I will see you in those lectures. Bye.